Okay, great. Excellent. Well, I'll introduce it real quick. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'm very excited to have Matthew Steiger here today. Um, he is a research scientist at Opportunity Insights, um, the shop at Harvard University. Uh, he received his PhD in economics from the University of Maryland, has a forthcoming pu uh, publication in the Journal of Human Resources, right, on the uh, motherhood penalty. Um, and in general, has really exciting research on economic inequality and opportunity, unsurprisingly for Opportunity Insights and unsurprisingly for us. So um, we're really excited to host him. And I hope we got to uh, chat with him a little bit. He has experience certainly working in interdisciplinary environments on these kinds of topics. He also has connections to census where he used to be an intern to the Washington Center for Equitable Growth uh, as a dissertation fellow. So these are also things that our graduate students may be interested in finding out more about. Uh, but besides that, I'm very excited you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, we have until 12, so I would say uh, let people know whether you want questions now or, or throughout Perfect. or at the end, um, and welcome. All right, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for, for inviting me out to, to talk today. Uh, please interrupt with questions throughout the presentation. Um, uh, happy to, to field questions as we go. Uh, so I'll be talking about my paper, Who Benefits from Neighborhood Revitalization? This is joint work with Gio Poloni and John Voorhees, uh, and these results don't represent the views of the Census Bureau. So um, uh, subsidized households, so individuals living in public housing or, or using uh, subsidized vouchers, often live in high poverty neighborhoods, and there's a large empirical literature that suggests that living in these environments can adversely affect a range of outcomes. And so we can think of kind of two broad strategies of how to improve neighborhood conditions for subsidized renters. One strategy involves moving households to lower poverty or better neighborhoods. And so the moving to opportunity experiment, uh, or more recently, the creating moves to opportunity pilot program in Seattle are two kind of prominent examples of this type of, of intervention and have kind of well-documented benefits of, of these types of approaches. But one kind of uh, limitation of this approach is that it's, it's not scalable. Um, so simply not all, all households want or can move. And so kind of a complementary uh, type of strategy is to use place-based policies to invest in and improve existing neighborhoods. And um, uh, kind of a, the, a general concern that economists have with place-based policies is that because these policies target places and not people, that the benefits might not accrue to the intended populations. Uh, hold up, I'm gonna try to get this thing out of the way. And I'm, I didn't say that, I'm monitoring the chat. If someone wants to put a question in the chat, I'm happy to read it out, but sometimes people can just unmute. Yep. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so in this paper, we're gonna study the HOPE-6 revitalization program, which is a large place-based policy that sought to improve living conditions for families uh, in subsidized housing uh, by transforming high poverty neighborhoods into mixed income communities. And so what this program did was it demolished hundreds of public housing projects across the country and rebuilt new housing in their place, which was supposed to be reserved for a mix of uh, subsidized households as well as market rate units. And so kind of the theory of change of this program involved kind of key three steps. The first is that the market rate units would attract higher income residents and that would reduce kind of the neighborhood poverty rate in these neighborhoods. Uh, second, that subsidized households would end up living in lower poverty neighborhoods as a result. And then third, that living in these environments would produce better outcomes, particularly for the children of these families. And so in this paper, we're gonna investigate kind of the first two pieces of this causal chain. Specifically, we're gonna ask if the, the revitalization program, one, successfully created mixed income communities, and two, actually reduced exposure to neighborhood poverty uh, for subsidized renters. So our empirical strategy is gonna compare uh, recipients of these revitalization grants to uh, sites that applied for funding but were not awarded funding. And we're gonna measure outcomes of individuals and neighborhoods using an individual level panel data set uh, that's built off of administrative data on income, residential location, and uh, participation in subsidized housing. So just to give a preview of kind of what we find. So we start by asking if the program lowered poverty rates in the targeted neighborhoods. Here we find the answer is definitely yes. Uh, so 15 years after the award, neighborhood poverty rates have declined uh, by eight percentage points relative to, the, to our uh, control group. Um, and these changes in neighborhood composition are largely driven by changes in who moves into the neighborhood after the award. 
as opposed to changes in who moves out or changes in the outcomes of the original residents. In the second part of the paper, then we'll try to understand who, if anyone, ended up living in lower poverty neighborhoods as a result of the program. So here we'll start off by looking at the original residents. And we find that most of these households moved away uh, uh, after the award and therefore were not exposed to kind of the revitalized neighborhood conditions. Um, but that the households that were displaced uh, ended up living in slightly lower poverty neighborhoods. So on a whole, uh, this group of, of individuals did end up living in slightly lower poverty neighborhoods. Um, we find that when we look at kind of the households living in our uh, control sites, that they exhibit similarly high rates of residential mobility. So it, it turns out that low-income households in distressed neighborhoods just move all the time. And this kind of limits the extent to which the program displaced households out of their neighborhoods. Uh, although we do find some evidence that kind of the demolition of the, the housing units, as well as the subsequent rise in, in housing prices uh, from the program did displace both residents of the public housing projects and some of the nearby households around. Um, although households who lived nearby but had access to other forms of housing subsidies like vouchers uh, were shielded from these uh, rent increases and were not displaced by the program. So next we turn our attention to new residents. So these are people who move into the neighborhoods after the award. And it's actually not obvious that declines in poverty rates in the targeted neighborhoods would necessarily translate into kind of reductions in exposure to poverty for these new residents. Um, and the, the explanation there is that, you know, it may be that these households absent the program would have chosen to live in some other lower poverty neighborhood. And so in this section of the paper, we're going to look at kind of where these households are coming from and argue that, uh, that it actually does appear that, that they're the households who live in the neighborhood after the award are exposed to, to less pop neighborhood poverty because of the award. Um, we also find that there's a 3% reduction in the population of subsidized households in these neighborhoods. So that highlights this trade-off between kind of reducing poverty rates in the targeted neighborhood and kind of maintaining access to that neighborhood for low-income households. Um, in the third part, we'll, we'll then investigate spillover. So there's a number of different channels through which kind of the intervention at, uh, at the neighborhood level might have affected uh, poverty rates in neighborhoods around the city. Um, and so here we're gonna, we're gonna argue that the impacts of the program were kind of hyper-local and limited to the very precise geographic area where these public housing projects were, um, and that we don't find uh, any evidence of kind of significant spillover effects in other neighborhoods in the city. And then lastly, uh, we think a little bit about kind of this group of, of what we call displaced households. So these are people who would have lived in these neighborhoods absent the award, but do not live in the neighborhoods because of the award. Um, so because most of the original residents move away, these displaced households are people who you know, would have moved in uh, absent the award. And we therefore fundamentally can't figure out who these people are in the data. Um, so here we have kind of the weakest evidence, but we think that these people are likely living in lower poverty programs as a result of the, sorry, lower poverty neighborhoods as a result of the program, simply because these revitalization sites prior to the award were kind of the highest poverty neighborhoods in, in the city. So uh, to the extent that these people are living in different neighborhoods because of the award, it's it just, uh, you know, almost mechanically is going to be a lower poverty neighborhood. So, okay, so taken together, um, these results suggest that the program was successful in achieving its immediate goals of one, reducing poverty rates in the targeted neighborhood, and two, reducing exposure to poverty for subsidized renters. I do want to emphasize that uh, that doesn't necessarily imply that this is um, kind of a cost-effective program and doing kind of a full cost-benefit analysis is outside the scope of this paper. But we do think that, that the results point to kind of three general lessons uh, uh, about the design of, of place-based policies. Back to your question before yeah. you do this. So you see, I'm getting confused between composition and quantity. The, the, you're saying that, and, and it's for example, the spillover question, right? Yeah. So if there's less housing for the lowest low income, they have, they have gone somewhere. Right, right. So how is it, is it a bug or a feature that you don't find in spillovers? I guess that would be the one that asked the question. The other one is that, it's got to be that even if compositions don't change in some of these flows, the magnitudes of the change. So, so I'm not sure if I understand the second question. So I think it, 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 to answer the first question, then maybe a, a follow up uh, to clarify the second point. So, um, the for the spillovers point, 
the, the finding here is that, that basically what the program, so if, if we're thinking about uh, uh, you know, the, the spillovers coming from, for example, um, people moving out of these uh, distressed neighborhoods, uh, our, our finding here is that rather than directing uh, a concentrated flow of households into a select number of neighborhoods and having a significant impact on, on poverty rates, um, what the program did is it dispersed people widely throughout the city. So it, it, it may be the case that there are, you know, uh, a large number of neighborhoods that experience very small increases in neighborhood poverty rates. Um, but basically those uh, uh, increases are kind of not detectable. Um, and, and furthermore, because these receiving neighborhoods uh, have kind of much lower poverty rates at, at baseline, um, the like, uh, kind of aggregate effect of that is it, it lowered the average poverty rate for subsidized households in the in the city at large. Um, and, and sorry, in the what was the the second question? Well, the, it's related in the sense that the flows the, the flows have to the outflow. You say there's a change in the composition of in migrants. That's very oh, I see. It's got to be that the there's an increase of out migration. Are you saying no? That's not right because it. There's already so much out migration and in migration that just basically relabels. Right. So, so for the out migration piece, um, I, I think I see what you're saying about the the magnitude and composition. So, for the composition part, like one story of what's driving the change in composition of neighborhoods is that this program just displaced like uh, disproportionately poor households in the neighborhoods. And what we find is that is not what happened. Um, so uh, uh, like low-income households were not disproportionately likely to move out of these neighborhoods. Um, it is true that in the short run, uh, there was a level effect on the number of households moving out, but because these populations are so mobile, within a few years, that displacement effect declines in, uh, uh, to uh, a much smaller impact. And so when you look at kind of the composition of these neighborhoods in the like 10, year, uh, 10 years after the award, almost all of the difference between the like failed applicant and revitalized sites is driven by the, the folks that moved in after the award and the kind of small remaining fraction of people who, uh, you know, who, who stay around who are original residents explain a very small fraction of the kind of total neighborhood change. Um, so yeah, it, it has to do with kind of these high rates of, of residential mobility in, in the neighborhoods. Okay, so yeah, kind of the, the Three lessons that, that we take away from, from this program are, one, neighborhood level interventions are, are a pretty ineffective way to target specific people. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily mean that these interventions are generally like poorly targeted. It just means that we should think of the intended be beneficiaries as people who move into the neighborhoods after the award and not people who were originally living there. And so that's kind of a basic point, but I also think it's this is like a misconception that uh, at least I've seen a lot in, in economics literature. So just to highlight one example, this is from a recent review by Eric Chin and Larry Katz. And they, uh, they say a final frontier research area involves the estimation of the impact of place-based policies to improve low-income neighborhoods on the intended beneficiaries. And then they define intended beneficiaries as the incumbent pre-existing adult uh, residents and their children. And so just our point here is that really these policies are, are not designed to affect this group of people, but rather it's the people who are gonna kind of live in these neighborhoods after the award. Um, the second point is that because there's so much residential churn in these distressed neighborhoods, uh, by targeting kind of a composition of people who are moving into the neighborhoods, policies could actually have very large impacts on neighborhoods while minimizing the displacement of incumbent residents. And then the third point is that the provision of, of subsidized housing uh, can mitigate displacement effects generated by uh, rising house prices from these types of re revitalization efforts. So before jumping into the details of what I do, um, I'll just quickly place this paper in the current literature. So there is a lot of work studying the HOPE-6 program. Um, almost all of this work either studies the effect on kind of uh, neighborhoods or follows the individual residents as, uh, as uh, over time. Um, and, uh, and we think that, that kind of these analyses paint an incomplete picture of kind of who benefits uh, from this program because the primary beneficiaries are actually the people who, who move in. Um, the most kind of closely related paper is actually a, a paper that just came out last month by uh, Eric Chin, Brian Stewart, and Milana Almagro, which studies uh, public housing demolitions in the context of Chicago. And so this paper uses a, a structural uh, model of neighborhood choice 
to interpret changes in, in neighborhood conditions before and after the award. Um, and, and they use that model to kind of make statements about who benefited from, from the program. And so we view our analysis as, as very complementary in the sense that we're using kind of totally different uh, empirical tools here with the main kind of distinction or uh, advantage of our paper is that because we're able to track kind of people as they move in and out of our neighborhoods of interest, we can decompose these changes in, in neighborhood conditions into uh, kind of changes in, in, in migration and out migration patterns. Um, and so, yeah, more broadly, I think this paper fits into a much larger literature that tries to understand the dynamics and distributional impacts of, of neighborhood change. Okay, so before jumping into uh, the paper, any questions? I actually have a very minor question. Yeah. <laughs> Suppose because of this fund, uh, you know, you get to live in such a building or a complex. Do other neighbors know, like, that you are the, you know, so, so the way the, the former version of, of public housing that exists in this neighborhood, it was very obvious because you had these large high rise public housing projects. And so uh, just like architecturally, these buildings like stood out uh, very clearly from the surrounding environment. Um, one of the kind of designs of the program was to reduce that type of uh, like I don't know, architectural segregation so that uh, the new housing units that were built after the award were often intentionally uh, built so that the market rate units and the public housing units looked exactly the same. Um, and so actually, I, I lived in a, in a neighborhood that received one of these grants in Virginia. And as you walk down the street, um, you could not tell, like from the outside of the houses, you could not tell which house was public housing and uh, which was not. So from like a viewpoint of like when they rebuilt the actual structures, uh, I think they did generally quite a good job of kind of integrating the buildings into the community. I think there's a separate question of whether or not the people were kind of like socially integrated and uh, there's a lot more, I don't think we have like uh, representative ev evidence there, but there's certainly kind of anecdotal evidence that uh, in the communities, there was kind of like frictions between people who were living in the market rate versus the subsidized households. Um, so probably less integration there than there was in terms of just the architecture. Okay, so here's a roadmap of, of where I'm going. Um, I'll start with just a, a bit of uh, background on the HOPE 6 program. Then I'll talk about the data and the empirical strategy and then uh, spend the rest of the time on, on the results. Okay, so here I just wanna make the point that, that this program really targeted some of the kind of most distressed neighborhoods in, in the country. Um, so what I'm doing here is just uh, plotting the distribution of poverty rates in 1990 for three different groups of neighborhoods. Um, so the first group, uh, this red solid line, are neighborhoods that do not contain any public housing projects. Uh, the blue dashed line are neighborhoods that contain uh, some public housing project. And then the green dashed line are neighborhoods that uh, have a public housing project that receive one of these revitalization awards. And just the point is, is, is that, you know, the, the neighborhoods that got these awards uh, had extremely high poverty rates. So typically, as like a rule of thumb, people often define high poverty neighborhoods as neighborhoods where the poverty rate is above 20%. And you can see that it, uh, you know, a lot of these revitalization neighborhoods had poverty rates in excess of 40, 60, and even 70%. Um, so these are very, uh, very poor neighborhoods. Um, the, the program provided uh, $6.3 billion in, in funding across 261 projects between 1996 and 2010. And so this uh, map just shows kind of the spatial distribution of these Hope Six sites across the US. Um, and so there were a lot of the major cities got one of these grants, but you can see there's also quite a bit of um, uh, heterogeneity in terms of the types of places that, that got access to funding. And so just to, to kind of zero in and explain in a little more detail what the program did, I'm gonna focus on one kind of case study, which is the Dixie Homes Project in Memphis, Tennessee. So this site got a, a $20 million grant in 2005. Um, here's some satellite imagery uh, taken a few years prior to the award. And so what I have here, these red boundaries denote census block groups. So that's kind of the unit of geography that we're gonna be uh, uh, using in, in our analysis. Um, and so the Dixie Homes Project is this uh, collection of buildings in the middle of the, the block groups. Um, and prior to the award, this neighborhood was characterized by 
uh, very high uh, rates of poverty and a lot of uh, criminal activity. So there was a gang that was kind of operating out of these public housing projects and uh, the kind of neighborhood had a lot of challenges with crime. And so what the program did was it started by just knocking down all of the buildings. So this is satellite imagery from a few years after the award. And you can see all of those old buildings are uh, no longer in existence. And then it rebuilt new buildings uh, in the same physical footprint as the uh, old public housing project. Um, and so it's a little hard to see, but, but the, the kind of style of these buildings to, to your point, Sun, is like very similar um, uh, between the subsidized and, and market rate housing. And, uh, and, and yeah, so some of these units are basically reserved for public housing residents and then the rest sold for market rate. Uh, and at least in this neighborhood, there was kind of dramatic neighborhood change over this time. So poverty rates fell from 76% uh, prior to the award to down to 22% uh, after the award. I'm sorry, this crazy question today. What happened with the, people, the former residents of the public housing while they, you know, they demolished, they built again throughout the several years? Yeah. Were, were they given any kind of temporary? I mean, what happened with them? Yeah, so I'll, let, I'll let show you. I, I'll show you kind of direct evidence from the microdata we have on what happened to them. Um, in, in theory, basically how this worked is that those residents, so they were either, either given, they're supposed to be given either a voucher or a place in another public housing project in the city. Um, and then in theory, they were supposed to be given a right to return to these, uh, these revitalized sites after the construction was done. Um, in practice, very few of them uh, did return. Um, we do find that in the short run, there's some displacement out of subsidized housing. So some people did seem to fall through the cracks. They just got, uh, you know, when these buildings were demolished, they lost access to subsidized housing. But in most cases, they just experienced a change in the in the type of subsidized housing. So a lot of these people just ended up uh, receiving vouchers and then using those elsewhere in the city and moving to just a different part of the city. Um, okay, so, you know, there was a, a massive decline in the kind of case study that I just cherry picked and showed you. Uh, but just to show you that this wasn't a, a totally isolated case, here I'm plotting for all Hope Six neighborhoods, the poverty rate um, before in 1990 in the solid line and in 2017 after uh, the, the last awards. And you can see just on average, poverty rates in these neighborhoods declined by 21 percentage points. And so, uh, you know, on average, something uh, important is happening in these neighborhoods. And our goal is to try to figure out, you know, how much of this change is driven by the like, causal impacts of the program, and then who ended up kind of benefiting from from the change. Do most of them look like that, where it's like a Alvaro Massa, or or some of it's piecemeal, where a few buildings come down? Uh, it, it it very much depends. So I don't have like a systematic. I, I've looked at a lot of these satellite images. Um, and across my like, I don't know, N of 25 or something, there's definitely variation where like sometimes they'll they'll knock down one unit and rebuild it and then knock down the other and kind of like slowly revitalize the neighborhood. Um, so it, Eric Chin's job market paper that looked at the, the public housing demolitions, uh, a lot of those in Chicago were funded by Hope Six. And so those were cases where, you know, he found, he, he found cases where basically there were two large developments, one got knocked down and the other stayed standing. And so there are definitely cases uh, like that in, in the data as well, where um, either there's like a, you know, a staggered kind of timing of when these buildings are demolished or just like partial demolitions that they only kind of revitalize some subset of the public housing in the area. Um, and so it is like, you know, the, this program gave a lot of control to the local public housing authorities. Um, and so there's a lot of heterogeneity across sites in exactly how it was implemented. The, the treatment is very different, I think, if you're doing staggered versus you know, extirpating the community, especially if it's, one is that no one likes to live in construction zones for whatever the change is while it's happening. Right. That's one aspect of the treatment. The other is that maybe you dislocate the whoever was, in, whatever you said, you made know, reference to a gang or something, maybe they get dislocated forever. And that's also, if you get rid of the whole thing, you can also get rid of it piece by piece, right? And so right. Really different things are happening there besides just the people who build. Yeah. So actually, let me add if there's a very similar comment online by Lydia uh, Lilliden, who says, uh, "Can you comment on the length of time over which the most of redevelop development occurred?" My experience with Hope Six is that many projects took a very long time to complete, including lawsuits from tenants, etc. 
So the conclusion that poverty decline in these places might be in part because slope six is basically an intermediary step towards gentrification by creating vacant land and necessarily moving the poor residents. So it's the same sort of timing question about how does it happen? So yeah, a couple, two responses. One is that in terms of the timing, I'll show you in a few slides, basically, um, at least on average, uh, the way to think about it is that there's like a short term, which is the first five years, there was a lot of demolition and, th and that kind of corresponded with like, you know, uh, demolishing the, the buildings, people moving out. In the subsequent five years, there was a period of uh, reconstruction and people moving back in. And then in general, things started to stabilize like 10 to 15 after, years after the award. So this was kind of a very drawn out long process. Um, so all the results I'm going to show you today are basically just looking at kind of like average impacts on this program. I, one thing that we're trying to figure out how to do in next steps is leverage the heterogeneity across sites. Um, because uh, like you mentioned, Hoyt, there might be very different impacts of uh, the like staggered nature of design. There's many other elements of the program that differ. So for example, the composition of how much market rate versus how much public housing, you think that that might also have a different, uh, different impact on these communities. Um, so we, I, I don't have any of those results today, but kind of in the next direction of the paper, we're trying to think about like how best to kind of leverage the, the fact that we have, you know, like 250 of these sites across the US to try to learn something about like what works well and what doesn't in these different areas. Okay, so now I'll talk a bit about the empirical strategy. Um, so uh, basically we have two kind of data points here. One is uh, data set on neighborhoods. So we use kind of public records to identify census block groups. So these are, again are a unit of geography defined by the Census Bureau. They usually contain about 1500 uh, individuals in each block group. Um, so we identified block groups that contain public housing and then those that applied for uh, and or received one of these Hope 6 grants. And then for individuals, we're gonna construct an annual panel data set. Um, in this data set, basically for everyone who lives in the US, uh, we're able to observe uh, for each year their income, where they live, and whether or not they have access to subsidized housing um, from kind of 1995 to 2018. And we're going to do that by combining tax data with uh, HUD admin records with some various admin data on address history from the census, uh, as well as the uh, census surveys, the decennial census and the ACS. And kind of the, the key strengths of our data here are the big one is that we can track individuals regardless of where they live and whether or not they receive subsidized housing. And so this is gonna be the feature that allows us to track people moving in and out of our neighborhoods, which is really the kind of new thing that, uh, that we bring to the project here uh, or to this, the, the analysis of Hope 6. Um, and then second, we're, we're, you know, I think it is important that we're able to focus on all of, basically all of the Hope 6 grants, uh, whereas a lot of the prior research on Hope 6 has focused on a few small case studies, uh, namely Chicago uh, being a focus of a lot of studies, which uh, was atypical in, in many respects. So our empirical strategy is gonna be pretty simple. We're just gonna compare uh, failed applicants to places that received an award. And so how the, the application process worked is that every year, uh, PHAs, so public housing authorities uh, would, uh, so you can think of these as like uh, 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 administrative organizations at like the city level. Um, so like Chicago, for example, has, a, has its own PHA. They would submit um, uh, a proposal to, to HUD uh, requesting funds for, for one of these grants. Um, and then HUD would, would receive these applications, uh, would kind of uh, evaluate them and then allocate funds according to, uh, to fund, allocate grants according to funding constraints. Um, and so we think that these failed applicants are a useful comparison for, for a couple of different reasons. So the first is that there was just way more demand for the program than there was available funds. So in any given year, uh, only about a third of the applicants actually received uh, funding. And so that means that there's a lot of kind of of these failed applicants that actually look quite similar to the uh, to the awardees. The second is that uh, the size of these grants was very large. So a typical revitalization grant was $20 million, um, which means that it's really difficult for PHAs to pursue kind of other similar projects absent these, fun these funds. And then the third is that uh, we think that these failed applicant sites um, likely shared characteristics that uh, with the awardee sites that, that led both of these groups to, uh, to apply. Um, and I'll show you some, some evidence on that in the next slide. 
Uh, and so the resulting sample that we have um, after we're, we're able to link all these various data sources together um, is a data set that contains 204 revitalization sites and 125 failed applicant neighborhoods. So these are uh, um, applicants that have applied in a year but never received funding. So there are some applicants that you know apply one year and get funding in the subsequent year, and those are uh, not in our, in our control group. Um, and then we're going to use uh, inverse propensity or score weights to adjust for uh, observable differences between uh, between these two groups. So let me in, in, in with a, who formally applied? Who, who applies? Who formally applied. The, the PHA. So so the the public housing authority would submit an application for a specific public housing project. Um, so like within a city, the uh, uh, we would know like exactly the public housing project that was uh, that had an application submitted for it. But is the city level this like? Yeah. So the 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 PHA is like the is is basically like the city level uh, organizational like local government structure in tasked with kind of managing public housing and subsidized housing within that city, and that's the entity that's applying to the federal uh, funds through the HUD. So let me present a couple of slides just to show you or, or to try to convince you that, that using inverse propensity score weighting right here uh, in this sample is kind of a reasonable thing to do. Um, so here what I'm doing is presenting baseline poverty rates in 1990 for neighborhoods that have a, a non-applicant public housing project, one of the failed applicants, and then the, the revitalization projects. And just the thing to take away from this is that, you know, in general, the, the failed applicants, so these dash blue lines, look more similar to the revitalization, the dash green lines, than a typical public housing project, albeit there are still some differences between these two groups. Although there's reasonably good overlap between the distributions. In other words, meaning that for any given revitalization site, there exists a failed applicant project that looks pretty similar. Um, and so we're gonna use kind of inverse propensity score weighting to rebalance the, uh, these groups based on observable characteristics at baseline. Here's kind of a balance test with uh, you know, um, a bunch of baseline covariates where I'm just regressing these covariates on an indicator for treatment. The kind of key takeaway from this is before doing any reweighting, the HOPE-6 sites look, slight, or look more distressed than the failed applicants. So they have larger public housing projects, they have a higher poverty rates, a higher share of their population are minorities. But once we implement the inverse propensity score weighting, uh, that eliminates kind of all the observable differences between between these two groups. Those weren't the weighting variables. Sorry. What was the weighting variable? Um, so we use uh, uh, public housing uh, size, poverty rate, uh, race share. So yeah, a lot of the. So you're you're right that that a lot of the uh, collection of these variables are in the inverse propensity score weights, but not all of them. Um, right. It, tur it turns out like. Once you, uh, all of these things tend to be pretty highly correlated. So once you do racial composition and poverty rate, that gets you most of the way there. Okay, and so one last piece of evidence here on, on just like the plausibility of this design. I think like an intuitive concern here is like, is there something weird going on with the failed applicant sites? So like, in other words, like all of the failed applicant sites that have a high propensity score, so that look like an, an awardee, like are those sites maybe like, less prone or less susceptible for reductions in neighborhood poverty, which would maybe let us uh, lead us to kind of overstate the, the effects of this program. Um, so to evaluate that, we just kind of compare what's going on in the failed applicant sites to the kind of general population of public housing projects. So this figure just presents a bin scatter where we've taken our propensity score model and estimated propensity scores for all public housing projects and then binned uh, projects into deciles based on the propensity score. And so on the y-axis here, uh, I'm presenting the average change in poverty rate between 1990 and 2017 for these different groups. And kind of the key point is that in general, you know, changes in poverty rates uh, throughout the propensity score distribution look reasonably similar between the uh, non-HOPE-6 sites and these failed applicants. If anything, failed applicant sites are experiencing slightly larger declines in poverty rates, maybe suggesting that you know, these neighborhoods that are applying for the program uh, would experience some reductions in poverty anyways. But what really stands out is when you add the revitalization grants onto this figure and clearly something different is going on in these neighborhoods. Um, and so this is just some evidence to suggest that like 
It's not something weird about their vital or the failed applicant sites that's driving our results, but really something very distinct that's going on in the, in the revitalization sites. Uh, two questions related to this. One is you have a sense of what the selection criteria were. I'm more familiar with sites than I am with neighborhoods than I am with other six. So with neighborhoods, the binary selection criteria was most likely to show the best, uh, followed by capacity. Yeah. Uh, and capacity meaning the capacity to show success and uh, which seems like it would be an issue here and sort of related to that capacity point. You've been presenting here just on neighborhood level characteristics and curious about city level characteristics, in part because the selection of sites involves not just sort of like, well, is this this particular two block groups like, is this a meaningful, reasonable place that we should select, uh, but rather like, well, what cities they're in, how powerful is the CHA, how much power do they have to do what they want to do, how competent is this application, and so on. So the summarize right, the two questions then are like, right. what are selection criteria and can you just sort of use that and think about that and say, well, the selection criteria don't really matter for the outcomes we care about, but we sort of think this through. And secondly, picking up a higher level of spatial aggregation, since these PHAs are not neighborhood-based PHAs, city level, a lot of the selection is happening about city to city. Right, uh, great questions. So for your first one, so the, the, in the HOPE 6 process, there were similar criteria of uh, having the capacity to kind of pull this off. Um, and I think that is largely about like a cross PHA uh, selection criteria of like, can this, this PHA actually, uh, uh, you know, implement this project? And so I think like that we would try to argue that, uh, you know, would have less to do about the, the kind of like dynamics in any one given neighborhood um, than across PHA sites. Um, the and I guess the, the other the other uh, aspects of the selection process were um, also evaluated on on kind of like the underlying distress in the neighborhood. So we do show that that kind of just looking at kind of uh, you know poverty rates and size of the public housing project and then a couple other basic characteristics does a pretty good job of like predicting who's going to get these sites. Um, let's see. But yeah, I think, I mean, we should do more on this. So I think, I think part of what's going on here too is that cities cannot, uh, or, or it, I, I haven't seen this in writing, but it, but it appears that uh, cities are very unlikely to receive multiple uh, of these grants uh, for, like for example, if, if, if Baltimore applies in a given year um, and then they apply in subsequent years, like they're less likely to receive those grants because there was like, a preference to spread these grants out geographically. Um, so I think some of the variation in, in like who's getting treatment conditional on propensity scores coming from that, we should try to quantify like how much we think that is because that's probably the type of variation that we really want to be exploiting. Um, I will say the, the other thing in defense of this is we went back and forth about whether or not to use these failed applicants versus the non hope six sites. Um, it, like you can see from, from this kind of figure right here that we actually get quite similar results when you do Kind of other reasonable comparisons, just looking at kind of you know other projects that look similar before the award. Um, if anything, we, we we think that this choice of using the failed applicants is like a bit conservative, um, just because like it did seem like these neighborhoods were experiencing uh, larger declines in, in in poverty rates over this time. Do within city comparison to the success you think about like look at uh, like Baltimore getting the one and then another comparable Baltimore neighborhood as the award. Right. So we we've done versions of that for just using. Uh, basically, the public data and and doing things like matching within cities and stuff like that. And for the the headline results, I'll show you on neighborhood poverty rates. We find very similar things. Um, doing all that for like the individual level data is a much bigger lift, and we haven't done that yet. Um, but yeah. Okay, so uh, I need to run the results, but basically, the, to operationalize this comparison, we're just going to use kind of a stack difference and difference estimator. So. There's been a bunch of recent papers about potential pitfalls of like two-way fixed effect models and event study designs. We're gonna follow this recent QJE article um, and uh, implement one of the strategies for dealing with these issues, uh, which involves stacking the data. So just intuitively what we're doing is we're comparing trajectories of neighborhoods that got one of these grants uh, to the failed applicants. Um, and we're using it, using it doing it via this, this uh, two-way fixed effect model where the, uh, it, this, um, D variables, the interaction between treatment and event time, and the beta Js are going to trace out the treatment effects before and after the intervention. 
Okay, so uh, now I'll jump into the results. So first part of the paper is, is just looking at, um, did the program reduce poverty rates in targeted neighborhoods? So here are estimated effects on total population in the neighborhoods. Um, and this kind of highlights the, the general timing of the program. So first five years, we see a, a drastic decline in population as units are demolished. Uh, the subsequent five years, we see kind of uh, the effects of repopulation and, and reconstruction of new housing. And then things start to kind of stabilize a bit in the 10 to 15 years after. Um, here are kind of the main results on, on neighborhood poverty rates, uh, where um, we're measuring poverty rates as uh, the share of residents who earn less than, than 15K in these neighborhoods, which is kind of roughly equivalent to the, the poverty line for a three household family. Um, and we see that uh, kind of poverty rates decline starting immediately after the program and this decline persists out to kind of 15 years after the program. So, you know, by 15 years after the award date, uh, poverty rates in these neighborhoods are about eight percentage points lower than the uh, the failed applicant uh, comparison. The, is this family income, personal income, earnings? So this is uh, adjusted gross income. So this is household, gross income. Yeah, household income. Um, and it's the share of, of, of uh, individuals with household so income. So the less are, than 15, uh, okay. The uh, units of analysis are tax units. Right. So uh, it's actually, um, it's, it's individual weighted. So for every individual, we know, uh, we like link them to the, uh, to whoever filed taxes. So like, for example, for kids in the sample, we use the income of their parents as the measure of like household income for people. So it's the, the income measure is at the household level, uh, but we measure the composition of neighborhood using individual level weights, if that makes sense. So you're assigned to each person in the household, the ADA of the top of the tax unit? Yeah, exactly. And what do you do with non -fiber? Um, Those are assumed to be uh, zero income. non filers are, yeah. Um, so one, one explanation for what's going on here is that the original residents of these neighborhoods are sticking around and they're getting richer. That is, uh, this figure shows that that's definitely not what's driving the results. So this red series is plotting the uh, average income or share with uh, income less than 15K for the original residents. And there's just no impact on, uh, on the income of those individuals. Um, this table then gets at uh, kind of uh, who is driving the changes in neighborhood composition. So. Here, what we've done is for each neighborhood um, in the 10 to 15 years after the award, we measure the size of, of different populations defined by groups of whether uh, their individuals greater or less than 15K, whether or not they were there prior to the award, and um, whether or not they have access to subsidized housing. And then each of these columns is a regression where we're estimating the effect of that size of that population, uh, the, the effect that the revitalization grant has on the size of that population. And so Columns three and eight highlight the, the population changes that are really driving changes in neighborhood composition. So column three shows that there's a large reduction in, uh, in the number of poor residents who are moving in with subsidized housing. Uh, and column eight shows that there's an increase in the number of residents who are, who are um, relatively higher income who are moving in without subsidized housing. So in other words, the thing that's driving changes in, in long run poverty rates in these neighborhoods uh, is the fact that there's fewer low-income households with subsidized housing moving in and more uh, higher-income households without subsidized housing moving in. And it's all about who's moving into the neighborhood. Um, and then lastly, uh, before jumping into the visual stuff, I'll just mention that we also find uh, kind of significant increases in uh, measures of, of housing costs. So five log point and 12 log point increase in rent and mortgage expenses, uh, respectively. Okay, so perfect. Uh, in the remainder of the time, yeah. So, of what's going on in these neighborhoods. So we, we've traced out like 
like in terms of the evolution of the housing stock, uh, I don't have it in the slides, but in the paper, like using public data, uh, the, the census has information on, on kind of like the, the number of units in the neighborhood and the share of those that have been like built within the last couple of years. And so we can show um, patterns that, that uh, support this, this kind of like dynamic over time where basically like in the first couple of years, they demolish everything and then there's a bunch of new housing built after on. Uh, we haven't done so much of trying to understand like the types of businesses and other organizations that are popping up in these communities uh, after the award. Um, I think that's something we, we is, is that kind of more what you were getting at is like, are there shops and restaurants opening up in these oh, neighborhoods? That's the thing that happens, right? Right. <clears throat> so at, at this point, all we've looked at is, is kind of changes in population and trying to understand uh, uh, almost from an accounting perspective, kind of what is driving the changes in, uh, in neighborhood composition. Um, I, I think your point is, is a really interesting one that we should look at of just like, yeah, just getting a more detailed picture of kind of like the types of, of, of um, I guess, non-residential units that are popping up in these neighborhoods. Yeah, some of the questions about like, are the local firms hiring people that work locally and that Right. Um, yeah. And so we haven't done that yet, but that's a great, that's a great suggestion. We should look at it. Related to that, you could look at the property assessments. This may be a different data source, but what are the assessments? What are the tax authority think the land value is? In terms of of, but, and then related to that and that, and Mel's comment is their income may not change, but maybe they move the, the people who leave move to places where rents are higher. And so their real income declines. How can you rule that out? Interesting. So here, I'll show you a result that half gets at your question. Uh, and then, but we actually could look at that more directly and we should, we haven't. So, okay, in this next spot uh, or section of the paper, we're going to try to understand if these declines in, in poverty rates in the targeted neighborhood led subsidized renters to live in lower poverty uh, neighborhoods. Um, so give me two slides uh, to well, I think you have to leave, so I'll tell you now. Okay. Basically, what, what we find is that, that these the original residents, they end up moving to slightly lower poverty neighborhoods. Um, and so, yeah, if you think poverty rates are correlated with rent, that means they, they probably end up moving to slightly uh, more expensive neighborhoods. I'll say that the magnitudes of those impacts are, are pretty small, um, but it would be interesting to do like a, a type of um, uh, like cost calculation or like cost of living adjustment to see if they're actually uh, worse off. Um, okay, so starting with kind of displacement effects, here the outcome variable is, so now I'm tracking the original residents, so people who lived in these neighborhoods in the year before the award, and then following them regardless of where they live. Uh, here the outcome variable is the uh, proportion of people who moved, um, and so this green series here are the former residents of the public housing project, and so here you can see that there are kind of very large uh, displacement effects within a few years after the public uh, housing demolitions. Um, so increasing the probability of moving by about uh, uh, 18 percentage points. But that effect dissipates uh, over time as more of the kind of uh, households living in the failed applicant neighborhoods move away. Um, when we look at households who uh, are outside of the public housing projects, but living in the surrounding area, so this is this blue line, we also see evidence that, that these households were kind of uh, displaced from these neighborhoods. So they're about five percentage points more likely to move uh, 15 years after the award. And we think that's probably driven by uh, the fact that the uh, cost of housing is, is increasing in these neighborhoods. Um, to support that, that hypothesis, when we look at households that are outside the public housing projects but have access to vouchers, we see no displacement effects. So those are households who wouldn't be affected by the rising uh, housing costs. Yeah. I'm sure you understand this graph. These are annual growth? Um, these are just, uh, so we're tracking uh, people who originally lived in these neighborhoods. And then the outcome variable is the share of those people who have uh, moved in a given year. So it's just like five and years after the award. Out of the yeah, who are in a different, so it's not an indicator if you moved in that year. It's that if in year five, are you living in a different neighborhood than the original neighborhood? But how, how should we interpret the fact that it goes down for the subsidized? It means that they went back? No. No, it, mean, it means that the, 
the people in the revitalization neighbor or in the failed applicant neighborhoods are, are also moving away. So this figure kind of helps to explain that. Here I'm just presenting simple uh, uh, descriptive statistics of the fraction of people who move, who are no longer in their original neighborhoods who have moved away by a given year. And so this is the control group. There's no demolition going on. And what's going on in the uh, in the former public housing residents here, or the original public housing residents, is you know by year five, basically 60% of those people have moved away, and then by year 15, 80% of people have moved away. So what's going on in the treatment is that in the short run it pushes some people out of the public housing projects, but in the long run, basically everyone's moving out of these neighborhoods. And so in that sense, these like high rates of residential mobility are kind of limiting the the displacement effects of the program. Um, so when we look at when we look at the original residents of the public housing projects, you know, one question that, that came up earlier is are these people losing access to subsidized housing? Um, so here that's the population we're looking at. The outcomes are whether or not you're in public housing, whether or not you have some other form of housing subsidy, you may need voucher housing. And then this green line is just do you have any uh, subsidized uh, housing assistance? And so what we find is that <clears throat> people are kind of pushed out of public housing, but much of this is offset by an increase in other forms of housing subsidies. Um, so a lot of these households are, are being pushed out, but they're receiving vouchers and using those vouchers in, in other neighborhoods. Um, although there are kind of some significant uh, displacement effects in the short run. So, uh, you know, in the couple of years after the program, there are um, uh, households are, are about five percentage points more likely uh, to lose access to any form of, of housing subsidy. Um, okay, so all these original residents moved, but did they end up living in lower poverty neighborhoods as a result? That's what this figure gets at. So the blue series is tracing out the effects of the program on the targeted neighborhoods. So again, replicating this finding that the, the poverty rates in the targeted neighborhoods is declining by eight percentage points. The red series now is asking, what is the poverty rate of the neighborhoods that these original residents are living in? following them regardless of what neighborhoods they move to. And we can see that the kind of poverty rates that these original residents are, are living in, um, there's some decline, but it's much smaller relative to the effect on, on the targeted neighborhoods. Um, and to the extent that there is effect, an effect here, uh, we provide some evidence in the paper that it's about you know, uh, the small displacement effects pushing households into kind of lower poverty neighborhoods in, in the rest of the city. I don't understand the interpretation of the red line. The comparison shouldn't be, you know, other people that kept where they were, like, so they were not affected at all by the original sin. I mean, why should, I mean, the negative values that you show there, maybe they are larger for people that were completely out of this. So these are, report. so these are, these are uh, estimates from that regression. So these are comparisons of the poverty rates of the neighborhoods that the uh, original residents of the revitalization neighborhoods are, are living in compared to the poverty rates of the neighborhoods that the failed applicants are living in. And so what this is showing is that like five years after the award um, or go to 15 years after the award, the uh, original residents of the, the revitalized sites are living in neighborhoods with about like a one or two percentage point lower poverty rate compared to the neighborhoods where the original residents of the failed applicants are living. Okay. Yeah. That, like, slide, uh, so the green line, right? That's the public housing. Yep. So since only 20% move relative to other places, let's, you know, I know it's a comparison. Um, let's, let's say it's only 25 absolutely that means that we should be thinking that one in four public housing units was demolished in these areas. I mean, I might have thought that would have been one. So, right? so I'm trying to understand like when I saw that point. Right. Okay. So uh actually, I think this gets at your question. Let me know if this gets at your question. So these are just the raw summary stats for the revital revitalization residents. And so what these show is that after five years. Uh, about 76% of the original public housing residents of the revitalized sites have moved to a different neighborhood. So we know 
how many public but how many public housing units can meet in the area? Just wondering how many people would be familiar with it. Everybody or a few? Because I'm trying to understand what the dynamics are. Are people moving to other public housing in the same area? Are they moving to other public housing? Right? Because it's not hundred percent. Right. They could easily move to other public housing in the same area. Right. So we, so the, these are people, this is whether or not you live in that same neighborhood. Um, so what we should do that I don't think we've done. So why, here, is, why, why is this not 100%? Right. That's the public is defined as really one of the Exactly. Yeah. But it, I, your, your, your point is still a good one, which is that like some of, if all the public housing projects got demolished in like year one, this thing should go up to one. Like it should be 100%. And so there's some combination of things going on here where it's like, maybe it's a partial demolition, so not everyone moved, or maybe people are moving out and then moving back in. And we're not actually tracking like the direction of flows. It's just like in every, any given year, you know, X percent are still in that neighborhood. So we should, we, we can and should look at like what percent of people actually are displaced to get some sense of like, you know, were there a set of people who lived in these neighborhoods who things were changing around them, but they didn't actually have to, to move. I think that comes to interpretation of that poverty line that you were talking about, which is people, so what share of people still in the same neighborhood, right? Right. Yes. So I, I'm running out of time. In, in the paper, we, we do provide some evidence that I don't have time to go into now that a lot of this is driven by people moving as opposed to people who are like sticking around and, and exposed to the neighborhood. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna try to, I'll show you one or two more results. Okay. so. Uh, take the, the key takeaway then is because all these people, the original residents, or most of them move away, then the people who are benefiting from the program are uh, people who move into the, the neighborhoods after the award. And so it's not necessarily the case that reductions in poverty rates in these targeted neighborhoods will translate into uh, the new residents living in lower poverty neighborhoods. Because I, as I mentioned before, it could be that these households absent the program might have chosen to live in other lower poverty neighborhoods. And so the way that we try to assess whether or not that's going on is by looking at the characteristics that these new residents, the characteristics of the neighborhoods that they're coming from. So the characteristics of their origin neighborhoods. So here, what I'm doing in panel A is we're comparing the uh, poverty rate of the neighborhoods that people are coming from in the revitalization sites to the poverty rate uh, that the, of the neighborhoods that people are coming from in, who are moving into the failed applicant sites. So the sample is looking at people who move into these neighborhoods after the award. And what that coefficient says is that people who move into revitalization sites, they are coming from lower poverty neighborhoods, but the, the difference in poverty rate is only one percentage point. And so, you know, compared to, to kind of the effect on, uh, on neighborhoods, that's much smaller than the eight percentage point reduction in neighborhood poverty rates that we saw before. And so to make that a little more clear uh, in columns, uh, three and four, the outcome variable is the difference in the poverty rate between kind of the destination and or origin neighborhoods. So again, we're looking at people who are moving into these neighborhoods in like the 10 to 15 years after the award. And we're saying, you know, did the people who moved into Hope Six sites experience relatively bigger reductions in kind of neighborhood poverty uh, compared to the people who are moving into the failed applicant sites? And what these coefficients suggest is, is the answer is yes. So um, people who move into revitalized sites uh, experience reductions in poverty um, that are about six percentage points in excess of the people who move into the failed applicant sites. And so we take that as some evidence that, you know, the people living in these neighbor are moving into these neighborhoods are exposed to less poverty uh, as a result of the program. Um, and then last result, and I'll wrap up here, uh, is that we, we also look at kind of um, uh, rates of, of kind of out migration. And, and so here again, we're looking at people who are in these neighborhoods after the award. And we find that uh, in the revitalization neighborhoods, people are about two percentage points less likely to move in any given year, which is about a 10% reduction in mobility. And so that's, again, some evidence that people are ending up in neighborhoods that they kind of like prefer uh, over these failed applicant sites. Okay, so I'm basically out of time. Um, so I'll just end there, but thank you all so much for your questions and I'm happy to stick around and, and chat if anyone wants to. So thanks again. I mean, if any people have to leave, but why don't we take one or two more questions and we'll go again. So, I mean, one of the levels of the problem was the question about John Clark and income. We sort of got back to data. So, what's first to clarify, because when you calculate the poverty rate, it doesn't include the CGI that you calculated. 
So yeah, so the like what we're calling poverty rate in this paper no, no, no. is just the share of of households with AGI less than 15k. And we expect a large fraction of median per perennium of people that are in the public poverty rate that are bilingual. So your your work in your income would be zero if they're not bilingual. Seems maybe unnecessary. I don't know what exact symbols you have that but you could use for instance information to increase the measure of income. But also I'm a little worried because over time you're gonna see the share of non filers and that particular non filing share of population is gonna change like you're starting in the eighties, right? The eighties? Uh our data starts in ninety five. Ninety five. So you have you're you right. have these success increases in EIC tax credits and and changes in the share of at least the people are filing with zero tax Right. So more likely to have been in the in the past. Now they're moving to final status. And now you're seeing their income in later periods. But you didn't see their income in the past, and you're seeing it from zero. I don't know if this changed the result, but it seems to add some kind of messiness. Yeah. Right? So, so you're definitely you're definitely right. Uh, two two responses. So one, we actually do use so starting in like 2005, we have access to the W2 records. Um, so we supplement that uh, in cases where we have non-filers, but they have W-2, so it partially addresses some of your points. Um, but the broader point is that it is definitely the case that uh, filing patterns change over time. And if you just, for some of the poverty rate results, if you just look at kind of raw descriptive patterns, um, things do tend to look a bit weird. And so that's why it's so important that for all of our, our analysis, we're kind of comparing within years the revitalization sites to the failed applicant sites because those like sources of measurement error basically difference out. Um, yeah. So why don't you, I mean, I wonder if you could do a certain sensitivity analysis like during the increase in DPS or grace, you know, do something for, for the non filers that can be difficult to do. Yeah, um, we should look into that. I guess, so one other thing, uh, I skipped over a lot of details. The, the actual poverty rate that we're using is, we look at your income over the last five years and are calculating the share under 15K. And we found that that thing, uh, when we've correlated our measure with kind of um, measures from survey data at the neighborhood level, that, that that specific variable, just looking at like, you know, five the five-year lag of income uh, share under 15K is like pretty highly correlated with neighborhood poverty rates. Um, I guess the, the other thing to note is like, we've done all this analysis with public data when possible, just to check results. Um, in the exact map, so for example, the, when you look at effects on neighborhood poverty rates, the exact magnitudes differ a little bit. So I think when you use the uh, you know census derived, the ACS uh, derived measure of poverty rates, you get something like a 10 percentage point reduction in poverty rates, but um, you find kind of qualitatively similar results on, on impacts on poverty. So there's probably more we could do of, of getting a better handle on like what's what are the kind of uh, bugs in the income data, but I think from like a broad level of like, did this program reduce neighborhood poverty? I think it's pretty unlikely that those sets of issues would have a, a major effect on that conclusion. What do you know about not the effect on the level of poverty of the neighborhoods in which the former subsidized people that had to move out, but about their own level of poverty? Like, because it's possible that they move to neighborhoods that are not worse off than uh, the neighborhoods of the applicants from neighborhoods that were rejected, but still they may be worse off because of this credit in their own in terms of their own income. One thing is the, is the neighborhood income, uh, level of poverty where they move, right? And that you show is even a little bit better right. than the neighborhood uh, level of poverty of the applicants from rejected sites. Good. But what about their own poverty? Like, or, or so, their, or their meaning or, or something about the, I mean, the displacement can be at, you know. Right. So, this this figure was showing this red line. Yeah. We're following the original residents, yeah. and the outcome is their own poverty rate. And so, for for the adults in these who formerly lived in the public housing projects, um, the program had no impact on, on their own income. Um, so, they, they live in slightly lower poverty rates, their own income is unchanged. Um, I mean, I think there's there's other and, and Jane compared to the failed applicant group. So like like what this is saying is that 15 years after the award, 
if you compare people who you know originally lived in the revitalization sites to those who originally lived in the failed applicant sites, their incomes are essentially. But you're comparing the people in the failed sites also that were under subsidized housing, because otherwise you're comparing to the overall population of the failed sites. That's not a fair computation. I see you're you're asking about the so, so you want this for for just the former residents of the public housing projects. Well, that, that seems to be the. Wouldn't that be the of the people who are displaced? Yeah, um, it, it will be exactly the effect of the displacement of similar people. People that right. were living in subsidized housing were not displaced by these kind of programs. Uh, I can't remember if we've done that or or at least yeah. released it. I, I'm I'm fairly confident uh, from what I've seen in, in this and other projects that if you look at the income effects on adults who are living here, that you're not going to find much. Um, but I can't remember if we've actually done that with this data of Chichak. I'll add one more observation real quick. Uh, and that is, I mean, it's an impressive data effort too. And having this for all the sites is really, is tremendous. So with the title, Who Benefits? I think it's, it's great that you're assessing sort of one form of heterogeneity of the treatment effects. And that is readily the clear story that it's not the people who live there who benefit, but the people who move in. But there are other forms of heterogeneity that I think would be interesting. One you mentioned is across sites, right? There's probably a lot going on. I mean, even piece of an identification strategy that you can do within city or within, you know, uh -huh. I, I think there is exciting stuff to do on that side. But the heterogeneity that sort of hits me in the face is racial. Um, and I think that's you no know, hard. We don't see that. And I think it would be really important to show uh, what happens to the racial composition of these neighborhoods who the mover ends are and so on. So I don't know whether you're already doing that, but if not, I think that would be so would be important. We, we have that in the in the paper. Basically the finding is that changes in income composition of the neighborhood are much larger than changes in racial composition. So for example, we find that you know neighborhood poverty rates decline by eight percentage points, the share black declines by two percentage points. So there are some changes, but they're less dramatic. Um, I, I mean, I think that's another, Again, I, I totally agree with this uh, suggestion to look at cross-site heterogeneity. And I think particularly interacted with this race dynamic would be really interesting. So like, yeah, are there, like basically do the changes in racial composition interact with changes in what's going on in terms of income composition? Um, and we haven't done any of that yet, but I think it's uh, it's interesting. Because yeah, you definitely hear like, like the stories of like the, these demolitions in Chicago Kind of the story was that uh, you know they knocked down the public housing projects and then a bunch of kind of like young white professionals moved into these areas um, and on average that doesn't seem to be the case but there certainly might be examples of that in the data. Excellent. Uh, I will have to wrap up because I don't want to cut in too much in your time with students. Max, I'm sorry you'll follow up directly. Max has amazing work with Sun together uh, on these kinds of topics. So, so we should definitely thank you all for coming and thank, thank you again. Appreciate it.